All right, we're going to go ahead and get this second panel started. Hello, everyone. My name is Hayana Dierman. I am the project archivist for the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation here in New York. Um, let me join my colleagues from earlier this morning in welcoming you to the conference. We're all so excited for you to be here. Uh, it's a particular joy for us to be meeting in a room named after um, Nelson Mandela, uh, a visionary leader, and Africa's greatest son. I just want to take a moment for us to um, honor the two or three pieces um, that are on the two walls. Um, the, uh, they're, they're both quite um, profound, so please take a moment um, as you're exiting the room for lunch, perhaps, or later on to, to, to recognize them. Uh, as this panel is titled, A Snapshot of Information Management Across Philanthropy, I thought it would be good to check into whether or not the Nelson Mandela Foundation had an archives, and it in fact does. Uh, it has a staff of three full-time archivists, and it's led by none other than Vern Harris, whom many of us are familiar with for being an extraordinary archival scholar um, in his articulation of the archival sliver. Um, in the archival sliver, we recognize um, and understand that a record is but a sliver of a sliver, um, a smaller piece of a greater whole, and it's the archivist's job, but here I'll broaden it out to be the information management professional's job to provide context to that sliver. We spoke earlier in our first panel about the difficulties in having records um, with no context, so um, there's great pleasure um, and great frustration <laughs> and learning about that context. And then an information professional sharing that with everyone here. Um, so uh, as we spend all of our days uh, purveying context, I thought that with this panel, we'd be able to give some context to those uh, context providers. <laughs> so uh, this panel is going to be a lightning round of eight to 10 minute presentations of information management professionals um, across the philanthropic landscape uh, and also from across the country who um, are doing some incredible things uh, in the field of information management as it relates to their institution. Uh, for our panelists, I want you to note that um, there's gonna be a break slide in between each of the presentations. It should be moved for you. Um, you'll be moving it to the next slide as you leave. And if it isn't there, uh, please uh, do so when you come up. Um, if you will note in the back right there, Nikki Lodico, my colleague from Information Management, she will be the one um, giving you your prompts for when you have two minutes and zero minutes. Um, and anything else that may occur, uh, we will very gracefully um, guide you through it. <laughs> um, so now let me introduce our panelists. Um, I'll be using uh, the guidebook app to introduce our panelists. If you haven't done so, please download it. I'll be giving brief introductions. Um, more uh, of their um, really comprehensive bios are available on the apps. Um, I'll, I'll go in the order of the presentations. Uh, our first panelist will be Elizabeth Stauber, um, Archivist and Records Manager at the Hogg Foundation for, for Mental Health, and she'll be presenting on creating a culture of transparency through the archives, and she is from Texas. Um, our next presenter will be Colette Ann McDonough um, from the Ketterig Foundation, and she'll be presenting on a snapshot of information management at the Ketterig Foundation. She is from Ohio. Uh, following Colette will be um, Nicolita Nikki Garces from the Consuelo Foundation. Her presentation will be Paddling Forward Through a Sea of Nonprofit Realities How One Small Hawaii Foundation Manages Information. She's from Hawaii, which is pretty incredible, okay? Um, following Nikki will be Stephanie Hislop. Um, she'll be presenting oh, from the Margaret A. Cargill Phil Philanthropies. Um, she's presenting on Archives Planning for Beginners, How to Begin Before You're Ready to Get Started. Stephanie's from Minnesota. Uh, following Stephanie will be Lisa Brooks from Candid, formerly the Foundation Center. She'll be presenting on Institutional uh, Strike Through, Foundation Repositories, The Key to Mobilizing Your Knowledge, and she is from Illinois. Following Lisa will be Lori Eaton at the Dorothy A. Johnson Center for Philanthropy at Grand Valley State University, um, as well as Phoebe Kowalewski uh, in the Division of Rare and Manuscript Collections at Cornell University, 
who will both be presenting on Archiving Forward and Backward, Two Perspectives on Capturing the Impact of Limited Life Foundations. Lori is from Michigan and uh, uh, Phoebe is from New York. So with that, please join me in welcoming our first panelist, Elizabeth Stauber. Um, so you can use that, you can also use this right here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Hayan. Um, howdy, y'all. Uh, <laughs> the Hogg Found I'm Elizabeth Sauber. The Hogg Foundation for Mental Health uh, was established by a Texas woman named Ima Hogg. Despite what I have been earnestly and insistently told many times by new acquaint acquaintances, no one dare tell me this here, she did not have a sister named Yura Hogg. <laughs> No, Miss Ima, as she liked to be called, uh, was the only daughter of Texas Governor James Stephen Hogg. Uh, and in 1940, when she committed her late brother Will's estate to the establishment of the Hogg Foundation, she had a simple yet profound vision for the type of future she hoped the foundation would help to bring into existence, to provide a mental health program for the people of Texas. Miss Ima imagined a future in which people with mental health challenges <laughs> would be treated with dignity and respect, and that mental health would be seen as indivisible from all other aspects of a flourishing and healthy life. Today, our mission is to transform how communities promote mental health in everyday life. And we seek to do that by working collaboratively with these communities and other funders in the state. In order to, to, in order to achieve Ms. Ima's vision and our mission, the foundation must be honest and transparent in its work. So the Hogg Foundation archives started in a very typical manner in response to a big anniversary. In 2015, we celebrated 75 years and I was hired as the foundation's first archivist. I immediately started pulling together all of the records hidden in the backs of filing cabinets, basements, closets, mysterious black holes <laughs> that continue to pop up today. You might think that there's a finite amount of space in an old office building to stash forgotten records, but no, that's just not, uh, that's just not the case. Um, so after establishing a modicum of intellectual and physical control over these records and orienting the staff on how to use the archives, I began to strategize how we might make best use of this information. If we hope to work collaboratively with the communities to promote mental health in everyday life, then we need to understand how the concept of mental health has evolved in these communities over the last century and the role we have played, either positive or negative. So in order to do this work honestly, we had to become a self-reflective organization that is, not, that is transparent not only to the public, but also to ourselves. What, we, what were we like as an organization 50, 60, and now coming up on 80 years ago? How have we evolved or changed? Or have we changed at all? How do the projects, controversies, and successes from our history subtly influence the way that we operate today? It was time to understand and contextualize, keyword, our history in order to make us better partners to our grantees and fellow Texas funders. So in order to promote the use of the newly established Hogg Foundation archives uh, and begin the work towards becoming a self-reflective organization, I began leading quarterly history lessons to our staff in 2017. My first lesson was on the, was on the program, about, it was, on a pro, was about a program in the 1970s to bring mental health services to Zavala County at the same time as the rise of La Raza Unida, a Chicano nationalist organization that had prominence throughout Texas, California, and a few other southwestern states. Zavala County is, a, is located in South Texas, 120 miles southwest of San Antonio and just 45 miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. It is at the heart of a multi-million dollar agribusiness center called the Winter Garden, where farmers grow crops such as spinach year-round. The agricultural economy brought in many laborers from Mexico, and over the decades this led to a majority population of Mexican-American laborers and white and a minority population of white landowners. The main goal of La Raza Unida was to improve the economic, social, and political prospects of the majority Mexican-American community 
that had historically been denied to them because of systemic racism. In the, 1970, in the 1970s elections, La Raza Unida began winning the majority of spates, spots on the school board, city council, and county positions. Leaders in the party imme immediately began applying for grants and attempting to bring jobs and social services to the neglected area. While La, Ra La, Ra While La Raza Unida had political power in Zavala County, it was tenuous because they still did not have much economic power or broad influence throughout the state. The Zavala County Mental Health Outreach Program was largely considered a failure. The services we provided through it did not last long after the funding period ended. We were operating as outsiders, attempting to bring support to a community at war with each other. The program required community organizing, building trust, systemic change, and a long-term investment, none of which we were equipped to handle at the time. However, the challenges that arose during the program are challenges that we still face today as an organization and a state. Cultural competency, addressing social determinants of mental health, such as systemic racism and poverty, and community building. We must use our past failures and successes to inform our approaches to these continuing challenges or we will fall into the same traps as we did before. Prior to the establishment of the Hogg Foundation archives, our knowledge of the Foundation's history was solely passed down through long-tenured employees. But now, four years later, many of our program officers have a unique understanding of the history of our Foundation and mental health in Texas. And they can apply that context with care to the programs and communities with which they work today. So once we had a good foundation for understanding our history internally, we knew we needed to look outward and make our history and current operations more transparent to the public. As a foundation housed within the University of Texas at Austin, a public institution, our records are already subject to public information requests. But we wanted to take transparency further. How can we best package up our past and current information into a format that is easily shared with researchers and the public? We started by implementing the philanthropy classification system by Candid to our grant records. The philanthropy classification system, or PCS, is a taxonomy that describes the work of grant makers, recipient organizations, and the phil philanthropic transactions between those entities. <coughs> Applying the schema to our grant records solved several problems, a need for better metadata, improved searchability of our grant records, and an organized means to share our knowledge and projects with those outside of the foundation. The PCS answers the following questions about philanthropy. Who the population served? What the subject and organization type? How support strategy and transaction type? And where geographic area served? Prior to implementation, the foundation, the Hogg Foundation, collected information about the who, what, how, and where. But it was embedded in our narrative reports and budgets. Information could not be easily extracted and discovered in this format and it did not allow us to track our records long-term to analyze trends. With a team that included our systems administrator, grants manager, a program officer, a communications, communications specialist, and a cross-unit liaison, we, and me, <laughs> we were able to refine the PCS to suit our specific needs and develop a way to integrate the collection of this information into our grants management system. This information is now collected throughout the entire grant process from application to award and has been retroactively applied to grant records going back 10 years by the team. We hope eventually to apply this to all of our grant records going all the way back to 1940. Uh, we're not there yet. <laughs> uh, we plan to leverage this information structure and data to improve the searchability of the archives collections database, provide more specialized access to our past and current grantees on our website, as well as sharing our current grants data with Candid through their e-reporting program. So, we are information holders, the keepers of the past and present. We can wield our power <laughs> to push our organizations forward. Archivists and prof information professionals have the expertise to lead projects that not only serve the information needs of their foundation, but also the communities they fund and the world of philanthropy at large. We're not just passive receivers at the end of the information life cycle. Through collaboration with our colleagues and active participation in the development of our organization's programs, we can all create a culture of learning and transparency through the archives. Archivists, with our shared values of memory, access, and use, 
should encourage our organizations to be humble and self-reflective by learning from our past mistakes, as well as to be open to sharing our records, data, and history with the public. Thank you. My name is Colette McDonough. I'm from the Kettering Foundation in Dayton, Ohio. Um, for an overview, I'm going to do a quick discussion of what the Kettering Foundation is and then our goals for information management. Uh, the Kettering Foundation was founded in 1927 by Charles F. Kettering. Oops. Uh, we are a nonprofit. We no longer give grants. We stopped that in 1981. Um, we have a tradition of uh, cooperative research, and our primary, primary research question is, I think I'm going to move this down. There we go. That's probably better. Uh, to what does it take to, what does it take to make democracy work as it should? Our original question, which was what Charles F. Kettering was interested in, why is grass green? And so slowly but surely over the past, yes, I know. <laughs> Um, slowly but surely, over the past, over uh, more than 50 years, our question has changed. There were many questions in between. Uh, we have a uh, we our original uh, starting was in uh, science and how to how it could benefit humanity, um, and we are a uh, we are no longer a grant giving organization but a private operating foundation. The foundation has three facets to information management, including the archive, the library, and the IT department, all working together hand in hand, mostly because the archive and the uh, library is mostly just me. <laughs> um, oops. Oops, I'm going backwards. Here is a lovely shot of the archive. It is in the basement. I'm not used to going upstairs with windows, so <laughs> I'm glad I'm facing this way. Uh, the Kettering Foundation has the uh, has information as a high pro uh, priority. Uh, we see three main assets uh, at the foundation being, one, our people, then our research, a a aka the archive, and of course our endowment which otherwise we wouldn't exist. Uh, it's terrific to ha be at a place where the archive is uh, supported, not just, you know, allowing me to come to these things, but also just, you know, monetarily. I can buy as many boxes as I want and all the plastic clips I need. <laughs> so our three main goals are making connections, making materials available, and protecting our digital assets. So how do we go about doing these? Making connections, uh, one, we have our database. It's called KIMS, Kettering Information Management System. It's just for us. Uh, it's, um, it was basically, we had seven databases and we made them all into one. So it's kind of clunky, but it does the job. Uh, our original archive one was called Chaos. Uh, I missed that one. <laughs> so in Kim's, you can find all of our contracts, our contacts, uh, the documents, which includes the archives and the library, and all the president's office files. Um, and each one of them is uh, searchable. Um, for a long time, we never... Oh, geez, uh, we didn't train anyone. And that's one thing that I've been doing in the past two years of training people how to use, one, the archive and the um, and Kim's. The pers purpose of the archives is to make you know, materials available for patrons, a.k.a. our researchers, uh, mostly our uh, people who 
the upstairs people, as I call them, and we get only maybe three outside researchers every year. Uh, I have been allowed to hire two part-time uh, workers. Uh, both of these ladies do mostly processing, allowing me to have time for all my managerial duties. Uh, we have implemented MPLP, more product, less process, so we've been able to take down our backlog uh, from probably a seven-year backlog to about five. We've tried to make uh, access easier by digitizing some records, which we are currently trying to work with the people upstairs about realizing that digital archives is a main issue and we need to address that better. And then protecting, oh geez, I think I'm going too fast now. Protecting our digital assets uh, is a major concern. Um, this falls uh, under my and the IT department. We work uh, closely with one another. Uh, we have off-site sto uh, storage when it comes to our backups, uh, which are located in Chicago, which is great in case of a disaster, uh, which Dayton just had one. Luckily, it did not come to our doorstep. It was only you know about five miles away. Um, so in case of a major disaster, our backups are house somewhere else in Chicago, um, so we should be covered. An important aspect has been training with digital archive, which means uh, myself and my uh, assistant archivists have, base, have uh, both taken the uh, digital, the DAS uh, classes through SAA, and uh, my ambition is to have a server that is dedicated only for the archive's use, uh, for all of our materials rather than being on the general server where they currently uh, are housed. Um, <clears throat> uh, this way we can have our materials better organized uh, that only the archivists and the IT staff, thank you, um, uh, can make it searchable and we can provide access to the staff that way. We're looking uh, into digital preservation uh, since we have an influx of that coming our way and uh, we'll be facing more and more of that in the future. And that's all I have. Aloha. Hi, my name is Nikki Geistis. I'm the Information Management Officer at Casuelo Foundation, located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'll be reading my presentation for the interest of time, and I want to respect our, my fellow um, panelists. And I do have a lot of slides, just to let you know. So, Casuelo Foundation was established in 1988 by our founder and, and benefactress Consuelo Isabel Alger. She's from a well-to-do and prominent family in the Philippines, the Ayala family, who have influenced business and politics in the country since the time of Spanish colonization. We work in the field of child abuse and neglect. We're not a grant-making organization. We are an operating foundation. We work with partner organizations whose programs fit our mission. Via the mandate, 75% of the program funding goes to the Philippines. We use a multidisciplinary approach to involve local, not national government. Um, we don't want to work with Duterte. The police, the courts, social workers, and medical clinics to prevent child abuse and to strengthen families. The remaining 25% goes to Native Hawaiian communities in Hawaii. The approach is different, in which there is a, more of a cultural relevant or an indigenous Hawaiian perspective implemented, such as Aina-based or land-based programs that our partners run. So in Hawaii, we use a lot of kauna or metaphor to relay our messages. When, we, when the call for proposals came out for this conference, uh, Consola Foundation was working with our partner organization based on Mokauea Island, one of the last Hawaiian fishing villages that remain. And the only way to get there is by boat. 
It was paddling the canoe that got me the idea to include some Hawaiian influence in this presentation. So I decided to use a canoe or va'a as a kauna for information management at Consuelo. So in canoe racing, all six members work as a team, as an ohana or, fam or family. Each seat has specific jobs, which I won't go in detail. So seat one, so, um, gosh, I think y your right, no, your left, my right, the farthest seat, sets the pace for the rest of the canoe. So I would say management or the president and CEO belongs in the seat. Seat two is the backup seat to seat one to cover the canoe's pacing. Seat three to five are the power paddlers. And I would say that seats two to five would include the records management team as well as people outside of the organization that has helped me with information management. So I think they belong in those seats. And six, seat six is the steer person. So they keep the canoe on course and keep the um, canoe, canoe paddling together. And I say, this is my seat. <laughs> so um, there's a popular olelo no eao regarding to canoeing. Um, and I mean Hawaiian proverb, it is eku ikahoi uli, or take hold of the steering paddle. So it's to steer your own course now and into the future. And I feel this is very applicable in being a leader, especially with having information management as my kuleana or my responsibility. So a little history about information management at Consuelo. There are 35 in employees, eight of them are in the Hawaii headquarters, me included, and the rest are in the Philippines. During its formative years, the foundation had the foresight to preserve its historical records. And in 1994, the board put into writing to preserve these historical documents. An official closed archives was created in 2006, and what an information management system was first put into policy in 2009. And it was the Philippines office that's been following that policy. However, the person that was in charge of that retired and no one um, took over. I came in in 2012 as a part-time archivist and it was not until 2016 that I was pulled in full-time as information management off officer b due to the strategic plan. So the employees were concerned with the lack of operational efficiency because of the you know, poor information management flow going on. However, I am also doing programs work as well as website stuff. Oh yeah, I heard that. <laughs> so since in 2016, um, the records management team was created with members from both the Philippines and Hawaii staff, so they helped me with information management. Um, we assessed and updated information management policies and procedures to include um, information flow between both offices as well as the man as well as managing di digital files by their way we are still using hard copies and haven't gone paperless so when we do um, share information is either through uh, Microsoft 365 or um, our boss goes to the Philippines every six weeks and we let him carry the external hard drive for the digital files yeah uh, sometimes Oh, and we also created uh, a digital archives where I use um, open source tools for basic digital preservation. Sometimes we wish the waters are like this, calm and still, and information management is, effortless, is an effortless process. Other times the waters are rough like the Kaivi Channel, and this I would say will be considered nonprofit realities. Um, one main one is the lower priority for information management. So um, management in Consuelos do not prioritize it. It took, for example, it took about four years to have the wooden shells replaced um, with metal ones. So I was chasing termites in, in the archives. And it also took two and a half years to get an archival management system. Partner organizations have also expressed individual individually for help on records management or building their own archives. And we were thinking of doing um, workshops for them, however, Evaluation and sustainability requests took precedence. Uh, one of my coworkers said to me, our partners are program driven, having an archives is a luxury. Oh, I heard that one too. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, I have other responsibilities and my positions have been morphing 
this year, I'm doing more monitoring and evaluations, um, working on the environmental scan, and thus I have less time on my primary um, duties, and my backlogs have been increasing. And we also went through our leadership transition for two and a half years. So we just got our current president and CEO um, April 2018. And finally, the need to go paperless is a recent problem. Um, the Philippines is is having a storage issue, and in Hawaii, accounting is having a very cumberless paperwork procedure. Um, and I also found out some other um, uh, issues in regards to like if we go paperless. Some of the things, and I'm going to rush through this because I got the two-minute time warning. Um, solutions, I got interns and volunteers that help with the backlog, especially with processing physical collections and doing digitization projects. The Association of Hawaii Archivists and the Society of American Archivists have been very supportive. Um, I've been getting professional development courses and um, talk with people to find out best practices. Um, and I would give a shout out to Jamie Coaglino of the Gates Arch Arch Archives, and she's over there at that table. So she's been my mentor for over two years, and she's been helpful with um, guiding me with interpersonal matters with management. And finally, um, this is, I'm lucky, Greg Arbery, our current president and CEO, he came from the Catholic Relief Services with 27 years of experience there, and he understands the importance of information management and organizational operations, that um, he will not let, send me here unless I talk about this research. <laughs> so um, it's to find an archival management system. He said, why don't you go check at the local um, foundation? So I did cold calls to 12 local foundations in Hawaii to talk about their informa information management system. And nine foundations responded. Um, over, And they talked about their um, grants, donor scholarship, fundraising management system. So you probably recognize these systems. Um, all in all, um, it's all, okay. it's all cloud-based. Um, a majority of them do not have an archival practice, especially with documents considered for um, historic permanent retentions. Um, and none of them are 100% paperless. So, that, so I thought the information wasn't, I had to find, go somewhere else to find information. So I talked with Archives of Small Institution to learn about their archival management systems and found Past Perfect in which, my, in which management approved. Thank God. <laughs> and um, the information that these foundations provide will be very helpful um, when we go paperless. So we may be a phil um, philanthropic foundation, but we're nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We have similar challenges like our partner organizations, Iku Ika Hoe Uli really is a leadership philosophy that I adhere by. And information management is not a luxury, it's a priority and uh, it's something that I will continue to advocate. So thank you. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Um, so I also have a script in front of me because I also will talk incessantly if I don't have a script. So thought I would try and honor our time limit today. Let's see. Perfect. So uh, hello, as my very clever title might suggest to you, uh, my name is Stephanie Hislop. I am a project manager at Margaret A. Cargo Philanthropies, or MACP. And as a project manager, I am not an information management professional. Um, I have no experience in this realm beyond what I've gained in the last few years. But I am a member of a four-person archives working group at MACP. And so I'm happy to tell you um, a little bit about where we've been and how we are sort of slowly but sustainably advancing the topic of organizational archives and doing the planning work that we hope will lead one day towards implementation. So we are pretty early in the process. But what I hope is that uh, the process that we have used is so slow and sustainable that I think literally any foundation uh, could do what we have done. So that is my hope for uh, inspiration today. So first, um, a little bit of background. 
So, of course, our story begins with our founder, our donor. So, uh, Margaret Cargill was the granddaughter of William Cargill, who is the founder of Cargill, Inc. And when she died in 2006, so not that long ago, uh, she was the company's largest individual shareholder. Margaret lived a quiet and unassuming lifestyle. She loved travel, the outdoors, the arts. Um, she earned a degree in art education from the University of Minnesota. And then later in life, she moved to Southern California to help care for her parents who had retired there. Now, Margaret never married or had children, and so she decided that she wanted the wealth that she controlled during her lifetime uh, to benefit others through philanthropy after her death. So she worked with a woman named Christy Morse, who is now our board chair, and a close friend named Kathy Hopper. And Margaret put in place a plan for her estate and created the grant-making entities, the philanthropic organizations that make up MACP today. So why do we go all the way back to our donor? Well, what's really interesting to me as part of MACP's story is that even in those really early days, MACP's leaders were compelled to record the organization's history, which I think is an important part of our archive's journey. So when Margaret was developing this estate plan for her philanthropy after her death, um, our leadership felt it was really important to have an impartial third party come in and document Margaret's wishes. So they recruited uh, two consultants who'd been doing Margaret's taxes for several years, who are Paul Bush and Naomi Horsager today, that's our president and CEO and our CFO, respectively. So Paul and Naomi came in and they documented Margaret's wishes very carefully. Uh, Margaret revealed what she did and what she didn't want to support. Uh, they asked clarifying questions and then the final report is something that Margaret herself approved. And this is so important because that report actually continues to guide our board and informs our strategy and approach even today. So how do we draw this line between sort of early documenting our history and archives? Well, this focus on donor intent and documenting our history continued, and it spawned a series of internal projects, some of which are called sort of legacy projects uh, internally, aimed at capturing and documenting not only our history, but also our culture and these important organizational milestones. Note that all of these are internal documents, so they've been produced not to answer any external need, but actually to support our own culture and knowledge as an organization. So even though we don't have a formal information management system, we have had a lot of intentionality around sort of documenting these processes. So uh, in the first bucket, our communications team produces several deliverables, including an annual highlights presentation for staff at the end of the year, and a year in review book, which even though it just transitioned to being a quarterly digital publication, it feels a lot like a yearbook. So it captures not just our grant making, but also our organizational events, our culture. It has a list of all of the employees in it in the year. So it's this really magical sort of book that we produce just for our own internal history, even though it'll be digital moving forward. And the next piece is that in 2013, we started to develop a set of legacy books that capture the first 20 years of our history. And one of them is a biography of our donor. Now we worked with a different partner to write each book and actually one of them, Eric Abrahamson, is in the room and you will hear from him, I believe, later today. Um, we also engaged Eric, who is a trained historian, to conduct oral history interviews, which I think will be an ongoing theme today. And those history interviews were conducted um, with members of our board and senior leadership, starting with those who knew our donor and worked with her during her lifetime, but then expanding to include several of our other key senior early leaders who had the longest history with the organization. So during the same time that we were really intentionally working on some of these compilation pieces, um, our leadership knew that we needed more. And so they started to explore the idea of organizational archives. And one of our vice presidents at the time, she has since retired, um, her name was Celia Ellingson, and she incubated the idea of organizational archives at MACP. And one of the first steps that she did uh, that sort of influenced our journey was to make a connection with the team at Rockefeller Archive Center. So uh, the folks at RAC have really helped to inspire us on our journey. In addition to giving advice, sometimes I just call them in when we need kind of a pep talk to get re-energized. Um, and so this began in 2016 uh, when the head of the RAC came and spoke with our leadership to really help them sort of suss out what were their goals and what was their vision for archives at MACP. And that went so well that at the end of that year, um, we actually asked the RAC team to come back and to do a day-long session with our staff where we invited representatives from different functional areas all across the building to come in and talk about archives. 
And so in this way, we were really focusing on two things. One was that clarity of purpose and vision from our leadership for archives and why it mattered at MACP. And the other, at the same time, was relevance and buy-in across the organization. No one was going to drop everything and make building an archive their top priority, but we knew if we started planting the seed early and getting feedback, then hopefully we'd be building something and planning for something that would feel really relevant. So with those conversations, we gained some more traction. In 2017, we formed a working group representing four functional areas. It includes our vice president, who's also our general counsel and the head of our legal team, our director for human resources and administration, which also includes our IT function, our director for, for communications, and then me, a project manager, um, but I also work on all those legacy projects aimed at documenting our history. And then this team reports to our president and CEO and our board chair twice a year. So the first thing the working group did was to focus on a project charter, something that we could hold up as a guiding document for the project. And we began by drafting purpose and objective statements. And we used examples uh, that we pulled from other organizations, thank you to the RAC team, um, as well as notes from all of those meetings and conversations we've had. And we intentionally included really broad reaching statements and really narrow statements so that our leadership could actually define where they thought archives fit in our organizational vision so it wasn't a stretch. And as you can see, we landed on a purpose that aligns with a focus on organizational development, donor intent, and planning for the future. So this feels really relevant to what we as an organization are trying to do today. So our next step was to develop a draft definition for what is archival and what isn't, which is probably our favorite thing to talk about. And you can see on the screen um, some of the philosophies in that blue box that emerged that we sort of held up as mantras for this work. Um, and you can also see from the tiny bit of red line on the screen that this definition, I think, might always be a draft. Uh, we sort of revise and iterate on it um, every time we come back to it. So we honed and we came up with this draft definition, and then we actually stopped and said, okay, we have this beautiful philosophical masterpiece, but <laughs> what happens if you actually try to apply it? Um, so next we asked two of the working group members, our communications and HR leaders, to lift up their functions as examples. So they came up with um, a list of the different sort of buckets or types of records and materials that those functions have. And then in each bucket, we tried to talk about what would be archival and what wouldn't be within that space. And then this year, we'll repeat that exercise with two more functional areas. So this process obviously is not leading us to one clear answer or a path. We have not yet built our archival system. But what it is doing is helping us to identify the questions that are really important for us to consider while we're in this planning phase. And it's proven to be a slow but sustainable approach that lets us keep making progress and moving forward, hopefully one day, towards implementation. So thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Brooks, and I'm the Director of Knowledge Management Systems at Candid. And I am going to talk, I actually don't have notes. My slides are my cue. So this is going to be interesting for me and for you. Um, okay. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, I love it. Okay. We're, we're fine. We're great. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about institutional repositories, and what I'm hoping is that you might consider thinking about these as foundation repositories because you have a lot of knowledge to share, and institutional repositories, crossed out foundation repositories, are a great way to share your knowledge. Um, so I'm going to get right to this. Um, I want to use academia as an example um, because academics really get sharing knowledge right. <laughs> Uh, and they kind of have to, right? They, they're mm -hmm. professors that are assigning, they're going to an existing knowledge base and they're assigning readings to students or they're using an existing knowledge base to kind of do a literature review in order to create new knowledge, kind of do their research and writing. Um, so uh, this is kind of, we do a lot of the same kinds of things when we're doing kind of uh, our knowledge production in the social sector and the philanthropic sector. Now, I'm not talking about taking a page from academic publishing where uh, <clears throat> you are going to have a company that's going to take the knowledge that, let's say, a researcher produces, put it behind a paywall, and then charge a lot of money in order for people to get access to that knowledge. What I'm talking about are institutional repositories. 
There are thousands of these. This one, for example, is the University of California Systems um, Institutional Repositor Repository at eScholarship.org. And it's a good looking repository. It's uh, basically where they're collecting everything that uh, knowledge produced by faculty, by staff, and by students. So you're going to find anything from uh, a dissertation or a graduate student's thesis uh, work on out to things like working papers by academic research centers, and of course, open access articles by um, researchers and faculty. Um, so what is an institutional repository? This was a slide that I was freaking out about earlier, thinking, I can't remember what was on that slide. Um, so here's the definition that's kind of critical to this talk. Um, an institutional repository is a searchable collection of digital objects. So you can think of things like anything from an image file to an, a video or an audio a file on out to the kinds of publications that you've probably funded, research studies, evaluations, this kind of thing. Um, users can access details about these objects, so there's some metadata describing the object, making sure that they understand what it is they're about to grab. Users can access the complete object, and the collection is accessible to anyone at any time. So kind of a, a loose idea of open access, right? Now, right now you could be thinking, that sounds a whole lot like a website with a good publication section, and you wouldn't be wrong. Here's a, a, an example of um, a site from the Hewlett Foundation, and I, I think it's a pretty gorgeous site. Um, they have a section called their Ideas and Practice section, and if you scroll through that, you end up with a way to search and sort and filter and access the full text of publications that they funded, that their grantees have created. So yes, so far, this is kind of what I've just described as an institutional repository. But there's one piece that's missing that's really critical to distinguishing this um, idea, which is interoperability. And so uh, this is just a quote from the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, so we can trust that this is an authority voice here. Interoperability is the technical glue that connects a global distributed network of repositories and other tools. So I'm going to give you a, a, a kind of a visual. I'm not a designer, so, oh no, I'm not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk just quickly about what that interoperability actually looks like. It's two new things for our definition. One is that um, we have data sharing protocols in place. And what that means is that we're giving computers a way to talk to each other. So we have a computer that has this data. and um, it's um, got a way to share it out. And we have another computer that's able to kind of talk to that computer to say, hey, I want to harvest your data, grab it, and use it elsewhere. The other piece to this is that um, there are metadata standards. So this is just basically the language that these computers can use to know that when I'm sending you a string of text and it's kind of wrapped in title tags, it means to this computer, great, I understand that's a, that's a title and that's how I'm going to use it in my system. So now I'm going to get us to a badly drawn um, little graphic that I did. Uh, and so basically imagine we're out on the web and we've got a bunch of repository sites scattered around and we've got these other um, sites that are meant to actually grab the data out of the repository to use in, in these other systems and tools, right? So things like WorldCat, which is the uh, world's largest library system, or uh, CORE is out of the UK. It's kind of a WorldCat, but it's more focused on researchers. It stands for Connected Repositories. Uh, and DPLA, you might have heard of, is the Digital Public Library of America. All of those groups are places that can go and grab this data out of repositories. Um, there are a lot of different ones of these. There's a lot of different kind of services and tools as well. And that is meant to be glue. So those arrows are just showing you how the repository is feeding out all of this data. And these other groups are grabbing it and using it. Now, um, I actually run a repository. You might have heard of it. You might not have. It's called Issue Lab. And what we're doing is collecting um, the, all the kinds of stuff that foundations and nonprofits and academic researchers create, a lot of different kinds of knowledge assets from case studies to evaluations to research reports and et cetera, right? So I'm going to talk about this uh, in terms of Issue Lab as a repository, and I'm going to take us back to Hewlett. So Hewlett did this report on disinformation and propaganda in 2017. And as you would expect, if you go to the Hewlett website and you go to the ideas and practice uh, section, you can do a search and find this very report. That's not surprising at all. 
And that's where it would have stayed, probably, except that Hewlett had the brilliant idea to share it with Issue Lab, which is a repository. So now it's on Issue Lab, it's in two places, and that's great, it's not exactly stunning, until you see what we do with it because we're a repository. So I mentioned WorldCat, the world's largest library system. Earlier, we share, we have, they harvest our data at Issue Lab, and in that way, this document ends up in WorldCat, which means that somebody at a terminal somewhere in the world doing a search on propaganda is going to get newspaper articles, journal articles, magazine uh, references and books, and they're also going to end up with this document. Same thing with CORE, we have them harvesting our data, and so here this is available to researchers doing re research on propaganda or disinformation. We also run services where we kind of do many um, issue labs, it's called our Knowledge Center service, so the Media Impact Funders also decided they wanted to share this through their uh, repository that's hosted by us. And we have another one for the European Foundation Center, um, which is uh, using this because their subject matter is all things philanthropy. And lastly, we do things like special collections. And so this report is a part of our democracy special collection. So Hewlett uh, could have, you know, they, here they are and they've got a report and it's sitting on their website, but because they share it with the repository, that uh, document is shared in all of these other places. So the folks using a WorldCat or using CORE or visiting EFC's uh, Knowledge Center uh, may never know about Issue Lab, may never know about Hewlett, um, but they do get access to this very document that they're actually interested in having, right? The last thing I want to say is that you can have your cake and eat it too. A lot of people think <laughs> that institutional repositories are really utilitarian and that they're kind of, kind of maybe even be ugly. Um, they're totally modern software. You can grab this stuff, install it, and have a web designer work to kind of, you know, pretty it up and make it look the way that you want. Or you can work with hosted services like an issue lab where you can, um, we can customize this to look any way that you'd like. Um, so I hope that you will consider getting in on this big knowledge share that happens when you use an institute slash foundation repository and start to share your knowledge a little bit bigger, a little bit broader, a little bit better. And I'm happy to talk about that with anybody at lunch. And that's all I have for you. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to share what each of us has learned about archiving a limited life foundation. I'm Lori Eaton, project archivist for the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation, and this is Phoebe Kowaleski, Atlantic Philanthropies Archivist at Cornell University. While we're both working with limited life foundations, we have very different perspectives. I'm going to get the ball rolling and then pass it off to Phoebe. I work for the Johnson Center for Philanthropy, an academic center within the College of Community and Public Service at Grand Valley State University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The Johnson Center has a mission to be a global leader in helping individuals and organizations understand, strengthen, and advance philanthropy. One of the services of the Johnson Center offers is to help foundations archive their history so they can understand and share their impact. And one of, the foundations, one of our foundation clients is the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation. Ralph C. Wilson Jr. believed that to make effective change, the impact should be felt from the start, yet carried long into the future. To do both, he earmarked a portion of his estate and the eventual sale of his beloved Buffalo Bills to fund his namesake foundation. The Wilson Foundation began operations in 2015, and they're just a baby. Grant making is focused in four key areas, children and youth, young adults and working families, caregivers, and livable communities. Grants are made in seven counties in southeast Michigan, where Mr. Wilson grew up and started his businesses, and nine counties in western New York surrounding Buffalo. With a structure that dictates spend down of funds by 2035, the foundation strives to match the urgency that people in need feel every day with community investments that consider both immediate and long-term benefit. Due to the pressure, trustees and staff feel to spend approximately $1.3 billion wisely and quickly, the foundation's culture is fast, lean, and digital. Fast because the year 2035 is definitely in sight 
and shapes everything they do, including the speed with which they're making grants. Lean, because the number of staff is small, under 20. They use consultants instead of adding staff. And of course, digital. 95% or more of the records they create are born digital. The records that foundation staff create must be stored, managed, and preserved with the understanding that documents may live longer in the archives than they did in the active foundation systems. The Wilson Foundation's leadership understands this and has begun to plan for this future. In April 2019, we selected Preservica, a digital preservation environment to preserve our born digital records. The records can be stored in Preservica through spend down and it can be set up to disposition accounts payable and other non-archival records that might, we might be required to keep for a few years after spend down. Most importantly, it can migrate file formats and prevent data loss for the files we ingest into it today through 2035 and beyond. I want to back up a minute and talk about how we're locating the records we want to archive. Understanding where a foundation is storing the records that will tell its story is a first step toward building a meaningful archive. Developing a records management policy and retention schedules was an important first step in determining which records belonged in the archives. Through the records inventory process, we took the time to note who creates and collaborates on what kind of records, where the records are being saved, and whether they should be published to the website or preserved in perpetuity. Luckily, in many foundations, there are natural dams in the landscape that are created during the ebb and flow of grant making. When a grant closes is a natural point to collect records for the archives. After a board meeting is another natural time on the calendar to push forward final documents to the archives. If the communication team announces that the website will be refreshed soon, then it's time to archive the whole site before it's gone forever. After a major event wraps up is another good time to archive photos, speeches, and videos while everyone remembers who was there. As you can see, we're trying to adopt an archive as we go approach rather than waiting until 2035 to do it all. Because I've been hired as a consultant and my time with the foundation is limited, I've also made it a priority to find ways to spend the archi spread the archiving tasks across the foundation. For example, the administrative team will be prepared to archive minutes and board doc documents. The communications team will uh, be ingesting and describing photos in Preservica immediately after an event. Grants managers will be trained to export grants from Flux and ingest them into Preservica. And I'd like to pause here and ask if there are any other Flux users in the room. And if so, looks like there's a few. If you have a way of archiving records out of Flux, I'd love to talk to you about that. <laughs> if you haven't figured that out, maybe we can work on it together. We'll also be um, using unit plans to empower staff to take ownership of the records they create. I borrowed this format from Joan Kazmarak at the University of Illinois. It offers department guidelines on everything from where court documents are stored, to file naming, to email management, and to what to do on the annual cleanup day. And yes, we're planning our first annual delete-a-thon. <laughs> we'll call it a weed-a-thon in archive world. This summer, we'll order lunch, ask the staff to bring their laptops to the communal lounge, and everyone will spend time cleaning up project folders, deleting non-records, and using best practices to final, name final versions of files. This ultimately will make them easier to archive. While we're getting the staff engaged with archiving, we're also working on expanding the trustees' understanding of what it means to create an archives. The trustees, many of them lawyers, have enthusiastically embraced the idea of telling the foundation's story and sharing its impact, but at the same time, opening records to a future public has raised some concerns about what exactly should be shared. Emphasizing the standards and best practices we're using to guide both records management and archives management will hopefully help them feel confident in the archives that we're building. We're also looking for ways to help them share their own institutional knowledge and passion for the foundation's work through interviews and storytelling, giving them some skin in the game. Finally, senior staff have already started planning tasks for the final quarter of the foundation's life. One of these will be to select a repository to take on their archives. I'll be leaving them with a list of questions to consider, questions much like the one Atlantic Philanthropy's leadership asked when they donated their archives to Cornell. And on that note, I'll turn the presentation over to Phoebe. Thank you, Lori. I'm now going to discuss my experience as the Atlantic Philanthropies Archivist at Cornell University's Division of Rare Manuscript Collections. 
Although all foundations may want to consider an external archival repository to house their archives, a limited life foundation has to make this decision much sooner. A potential repository could be a university with strong ties to the foundation, as is the case with Cornell and Atlantic. As you may know, Cornell is Chuck Feeney's alma mater and a major recipient of Atlantic funding. Other possibilities include archives specially dedicated to philanthropy, such as the Rockefeller Archive Center. It is crucial that the identification of and communication with an archival repository starts early, particularly for a foundation who is in the process of spending down. This will allow a better opportunity to work closely with archive staff in order to discuss the organization and accessibility of the foundation's archives. In the case of the Atlantic Philanthropies, initial discussions began two years prior to the first shipment of records to the archives. Cornell's proposal for project planning funding was submitted and approved in 2014. In January 2015, an archi archives consultant was hired by Cornell to survey records, both paper and electronic, at the New York, Bermuda, Belfast, and Dublin offices. As a result, she drafted an in-depth processing plan. And so by September 2015, Cornell was awarded, grant, awarded the grant to house, process, and promote Atlantic's archives. In 2016, a date of grant was drawn up and signed by Atlantic and Cornell staff. In addition to providing the transfer of title, the date of gift also outlined, outlined the physical transfer of the collection, as well as listed types of records to be excluded, included, or restricted. It is important to remember that even though an archive receives your materials, it does not mean they will make those materials immediately available to researchers. The deed of gift also established the Archives Advisory Committee in order to com continue the dialogue between Cor Cornell and Atlantic, and we meet up with them um, um, twice a month. Now we're down to once a month, and we have in-person meetings once a year. So close, close communication. Our first of many shipments arrived in October 2016, and through July through December 2016, project staff, including myself, were hired and we began processing in February of 2017. And I want to point out this slide is out of date. We'll be opening parts of the collection in September so we can include the grant files for Ireland, a major area of impact in Atlantic's grant making. So it'll be Ireland, Northern Ireland, South Africa, Vietnam, and Great Britain. All those grant files will be available in September for research. Communicating access restrictions and the logistics of transferring the archives aside, starting the conversation early with the repository is also crucial for the processing and eventual accessibility of the collection. Processing facilitates future access for researchers through physical and intellectual arrangement, as well as thorough description of the collection. We inventory the, context, the contents of a collection at a folder level, flag restrictions, organize, create a finding aid, as the name suggests, the finding aid assists the researcher by providing him or her not only with an inventory, but also a context for the records. What are the records in this collection? Who created and kept these records? How are they arranged? This finding aid will be published online and can be found through a simple Google search. Processing is not fully dependent on the work of the archivist alone. Archive staff will not have the institutional memory that a foundation staff have. After a foundation closes its doors, archivists will have a harder time identifying records, their creators, and the context in which they were created. Working as closely with Atlantic as I have the past two years has been a great privilege not always afforded to archivists. All too often, archivists receive boxes of records with little information as to what they are and who created them, and then thus have to do detective work in order to fill in the gaps of knowledge. Given the fact that so far my team and I have processed over 1,200 banker boxes of records for the Atlantic Philanthropies archives, I cannot imagine how much more challenging it would have been without the benefit of Atlantic's guidance. In addition to consulting with Atlantic staff, we have also had the added benefit of access to their Flux account. This, have, this has been invaluable resource as we inventory grant files. We have often received folders labeled with only the grantee name and grant number. This paucity of information would make, it, would make specific grants difficult to search for. However, however, using the grant number, we were able to locate the record for the grant and include the official title in the inventory. Mm -hmm. Flux is also useful in helping us identify the official names 
of grantee organizations. Over the decades of Atlantic's grant making, grantee names have sometimes changed. In order to create uniformity, we have been organizing the grant files by the name of the organization as it appeared in Flux. Flux is also a rich resource of digital grant related records. Our digital archivist has been working diligently to extract these records. And actually, Lori, she just figured it out. Oh, awesome. So you, sh you guys should talk. <laughs> so we will have these records once the contract with Flux comes to an end. And at this point, we have a lot of digital records in this collection that we have not started processing yet. We have hard drives, CEO emails, the website, a little bit of everything. So that will be fun. Atlantic's robust communications program has also been an asset to processing. We have often referred to Atlantic's website in order to guide our description of the collection. For instance, when I wanted to include in the finding aid the dates of when the Johannesburg office was operating, I needed only to refer to the South Africa Country Book, which is available on Atlantic's website. In addition to numerous publications, the website also contains an easily searchable grants database, which has been useful in our description of the grant files. It is important to note that Atlantic's website was rebuilt in 2016 in order to better create a narrative of Atlantic's legacy. Central to the rebuilding was an in-depth process involving a great deal of research and close communication with prospective audiences. In their January 2017 article, Planning for the Afterlife, Elizabeth Cowell and David Morse wrote, we had to think long-term and design our site so it continued to be useful even after Atlantic ceased to exist. Given the amount of resources available on Atlantic's website and how well it has been curated, we believe that it will serve as a starting point for most researchers. The publications available will help provide a val valuable narrative that can guide research, but the grants database itself will particularly allow for the seamless transition between researching on the website and in the physical archives. Each grant on the Atlantic Philanthropy's publicly available database has been tagged with controlled vocabularies. Using their own personalized taxonomy, Atlantic classified each grant by the issue it addressed and the predefined somewhat broad program area that it historically fell under, such as higher education or peace and reconciliation. They also employed Candid's philanthropy classification system, formerly the Foundation Center, which provides more granularity in describing each grant. In order to ease the transition of research from website to archives, we've been using these vocabularies to tag grant files in the collections finding aid in lieu of the traditional Library of, Con Library of Congress subject headings. So here is the draft of the finding aid, and down here is an excerpt of the inventory where we, you can see where we've added these vocabularies. Currently at the Division of Rare and Manuscript Collections, we are transitioning to archive space, a new collections management system. The back end has already been implemented and within the next few years, the user interface will be put in place. The new interface will allow for more dynamic searching aid with greater searching capabilities. So even though it's fairly static right now, eventually you'll be able to click on higher education or peace and reconciliation, see all those grants made in those program areas. When one thinks of archives, one inevitably thinks of the past. However, so much of our work looks to the future the future condition of the records and the researchers who will search them. Just as archivists have to look ahead, so do foundations who wish to preserve their legacy for future generations. The message is plan early, be proactive. Although your doors may be closing, you have the ability to impact the future of philanthropy through leaving behind a well-organized, well-contextualized record of your past. Thank you. Thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. We are perfectly on time, so that is extraordinary. <laughs> um, I thought this was just a fantastic and comprehensive panel um, speaking about information management, um, both in foundations, around foundations, at universities dealing with foundation records. Um, so, so thank you. These really are the folks with the boots on the ground, so it is a privilege that you're here and that we can learn from you. Uh, we are going to have um, a couple of mic runners uh, for our Q&A round. We have about um, uh, 15 minutes, uh, around 1 o'clock, we'll go for a break. Um, and then we're going to have a couple of mics for our panelists. 
and then um, at, or if you agree. Uh, and then um, as the question is asked to the individual who it's directed to, uh, please pass it around as needed. Um, can our two mic runners raise their hands? Fantastic. Um, and so with that, let's open it up for questions. Oh, Andrea. Thank you so much. Hi, um, thank you all for your presentations. My question is for Lisa. How do you communicate with organizations? A little bit to Stephanie's point, you know, we oftentimes do things very slowly with a lot of um, care and thought, particularly to how people see us and our reputations. And so how do you talk to organizations that might have some reluctance about having their records on the internet? Um, which is a little bit different from having them in a repository where you have to reach out to an archivist or a research expert to help you get access to them. So how do you right. talk to them about those concerns? Right. I yell a lot <laughs> and then uh, explain that, um, or try, try to just have a conversation about what are we really trying to do when we're creating the kind of knowledge that I am working on sharing, right? It's that we're creating this knowledge to further the, you know, kind of the, the work that we're doing in the social sector. And so, and also trying to open minds around who would actually find this stuff useful in their work. It's not just, you know, folks in another foundation or in a like-minded organization. It's gonna be, uh, it, it could be all kinds of folks. It could be students, you know, studying, stu studying nonprofits and philanthropy or sociology or political science or, you know, any number of disciplines. Um, so I think it's it's just kind of trying to um, overcome. It is a fear, I think, right, of exposure and feeling vulnerable. And you know, I run across a lot of copyrights in my work where it will, you know, have a, a disclaimer that you know this is the funder, but we do not. And this doesn't represent our thinking, kind of stuff, which is fine um, and probably true in a lot of cases. But I think it's just trying to get folks to open their minds to the fact that you funded something. Thing, like you know this report in order to further knowledge and further our way of thinking about something and create new strategies in a lot of different ways and in many ways that we could never think of and so letting it go out there into the ethers is actually a good idea if you think about the what your maybe initial thinking was to even produce this Thank you. Hi, I guess I'll stand. Um, my name is Himaya Awadicham. I'm an intern here at the Ford Foundation with the information management team. And this is a question to anyone who's working at the limited uh, time or limited life um, foundations. Um, I'm, I'm kind of just curious, what does organizing information that you know is gonna, like has a cap on it, what, what does that look, for, look like? And what does preparing for the end of an organization mean for the information that you're um, producing and collecting and, and kind of what does it mean to, to maintain that legacy that you know is going to end pretty pretty soon? It's, um, it's a daunting task, just, but it's, um, it's also challenging. Um, it's been a lot of education of the staff so that they f realize that what they're creating um, has meaning and importance and tells the story so that it will be preserved. Um, it's been a lot of training and we'll be doing more training before I'm finished there about file naming, really basic boring stuff. I feel like everybody's mother saying, you know, clean up your stuff, clean up your room. Um, it's, it's that nitty gritty level of, of where are you saving things that can't be all in your emails we talked about before. Um, the more systems that we can use, the better training people to use Flux for as many grant records as possible. Um, the, the senior level team and the board really have that long-term vision. And as I said, they're planning already for the end. One of the reasons they're not hiring a lot of staff is so that um, they won't have to let a lot of people go. So they're really thinking long-term about that. Um, Sometimes we'll be in a staff meeting and they'll talk about a story someone told and I'll ask, how are we capturing that? So some of that thinking still needs to filter down a little bit more broadly. Um, so it's that granular, but it's also that broad storytelling. What's going on at a board meeting that I can't see based on documents might be some of that storytelling that we want to capture too. 
So oral history is a good, a good way to do that, I think. So we're working on that. And coming from someone who's receiving these files and boxes from so many offices, from Johannesburg to Hanoi to Belfast, Dublin, this seems really basic, but label things. <laughs> um, you know, because sometimes it would be some office worker putting files willy-nilly in a box and they label the wrong name, the wrong thing, so we don't really know what we're looking at. It's like, oh, the correspondence, no, this is, these are grant files. This is, or so-and-so's name will be on a box. No, actually, this is the name of the person who boxed these f records. <laughs> they, no. And um, actually, in South Africa, in the office in Johannesburg, there were two archivists on staff not doing archive, archivist work, but their files were beautiful. They're labeled everything like grant numbers, grantee names, like everything was like perfectly organized. But so people don't think that, just label, label please. And dates. Yes, yes. <laughs> I have a question um, for Nikki and then perhaps Colette and Elizabeth, if you have anything to add to it, please do. Um, when you were transitioning, Nikki, from a part-time staff member to a full-time staff member to the role of an information management officer, um, you said it was alongside a strategic plan. Um, can you talk more about that? Um, did you have input in the plan? What was it like to roll it out, et cetera? No, I didn't have input in the plan. It was a surprise, actually. <laughs> um, but what the employees Let's see, the um, management actually reached out to the employees. Looks like it was full-time employees. And they had concerns about finding particular documents on time, especially with time-sensitive um, projects that they were doing. And one thing, too, since your name is Hayan, there's ty there was Typhoon Hayan that happened <laughs> in the Philippines. <laughs> and we were very, we, um, helped out with the recovery process over there. And it was a joint effort with organizations in Hawaii. So the news folks were asking for photos and all of that. So we didn't have the photos. To, um, the headquarters in Hawaii didn't have the um, photos. But it was in um, the Philippines. And so it was having those kinds of um, um, digital, digital photos in Hawaii that also sparked that um, concern. So um, yeah, so the flow of information was really important to both offices for Consola Foundation. Yeah. Hi, hi. Oh, excuse me, please. Yes, yes. so uh, my name is Pat Rosenfield, and I have a question for Stephanie and Lori. Um, at the early end of the stage, I'm just, it's, it's really exciting to hear, especially in depth, how the Cargill and, and the Wilson Foundations are trying to develop archives early on, whether in perpetuity, whether the foundation exists in perpetuity, or is time limited. So uh, my question is, how are you talking, what process do you have for talking with other new foundations to persuade them to follow in your footsteps in creating uh, such thorough archives? Well, I can start, I would say uh, you're looking at it. So this is, um, I was complimenting several of the organizers that, um, you know, while we had been using sort of consultations with the RAC to help us understand and learn about the industry and help us um, know what examples we should be looking for and who else we should be talking to, we're pretty early on in the process. So this conference sort of feels like the beginning for us of actually entering into this community and engaging with other folks who are doing this work. And so I think uh, we are optimistic and hopeful that there will be more connections and that, um, as I said, I think our, hopefully our story is not intimidating to anyone who's thinking about doing this work, you know, how we transition from the planning towards implementation, knowing that we're going to need sort of expert resources at that stage. I think that's a big hurdle for us that um, I think is one of the next steps in our journey. And so I'll be excited to learn from others about that and hopefully one day to be able to share that with other organizations. And I would say that um, my home at, the, at Grand Valley at the Johnson Center has expectations for publishing what I'm learning as I work with the Wilson Foundation. So that will certainly be something um, they publish the foundation review. Um, and participating in places in conferences like this, but also um, trying to participate in um, conferences where there aren't archives. And I know Phoebe attended the Center for Effective, uh, Effective Philanthropy. Philanthropy and was a bit of an ambassador there. So making those opportunities uh, 
a, a priority. I think we have some in the front. Um, I just want or if you could wait for the mic, thank you. Okay, right. Um, I just want to say that as soon as I found out about this conference, I thought of our peak grant making conference that we haven't had anything about archiving there. So I think that would be a great opportunity there annually in March. And uh, so I think that would be some place that we could use this information. Thank you. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you a question at Candid. Um, when you talked about uh, like right now at the Kresge Foundation, we add our information in manually for geographic areas served and that type of thing so that it flows to you. Mm -hmm. But when you were speaking, most of it is project based, so it might be a, a grantee, and uh, grantees may be spread across several different places, and the, and the foundation is somewhere else. The, the actual grantee is somewhere else, and they're servicing other organizations or areas, do you um, base yours on where the foundation, where the organization is, or are you just pulling it from us when we give it to you? Do you like, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I don't work in that area, okay. but I want to say that, well, we do, uh, there are other candid people here that can answer that question. I cannot answer Okay, because I was wondering if we're doing accurate. double duty or something, or if it's doing it for, if you're doing it for us, then we're maybe doubling up in some places and maybe not in others. I was just curious. Right. I'm going to find out for you and okay. tell you at lunch. Okay. 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 Do we have a person, oh, somebody over here can. I guess this is a speak of the devil moment. Um, I'm also a candid, uh, Larry McGill, Vice President for Knowledge Services. I actually was gonna make a follow-up comment uh, related to the PEAK conference, because just this year, uh, we started uh, announcing an annual award called the Hashtag uh, Open for Good Award, which is about uh, sharing knowledge. So I think we have some nominees sitting uh, on the dais and uh, you might keep that in mind as a way of keeping visibility on the issue of sharing knowledge uh, through lots of different mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Um, oh, that's the same table. Great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Suzanne Pichler from the Mellon Foundation. And uh, a couple of the panelists mentioned um, using vocabularies or following taxonomies. And I wondered, um, among all the panelists, how how extensive this use is, um, if you have taken sort of taxonomies off the shelf or developed your own, um, and, and how you use them. So I took it from Candid, the philanthropy classification system, um, but we did modify it to for our use. And this, this did take some time because language is something that's very important at the Hogg Foundation. Um, and so we had a lot of conversations over um, a span of about a year as we were modifying this. But um, we, we started out uh, thinking over, over complicated. Um, and we're like, we're going to bring in the medical subject headings. We're going to bring in stuff from the American Psych Psychology Association. We're going to bring in all these other uh, vocabularies and mesh them all together. Um, and that was uh, just, we were overthinking it. Um, philanthropy classification system was, was um, had the bones that we needed, and we um, were able to just add a few terms here and there that were specific to our, our grants. But um, yeah, w we didn't want to reinvent the wheel when there's so many out there. Um, I, I want to say, for, oh, sorry, please. Okay. Um, I, my former boss uh, developed a program uh, a list basically from scratch, which has been kind of set off to the side because a lot of the naming that we've used, uh, it's about 10, it's a 10 year old document. So a lot of the naming that we've used has kind of gone off to the wayside. Uh, but for the archive, it is useful and I use it in my training so I can you know, say, I was like, well, this is how we used to name things and this is what they're called now. So I think I probably should update that document. So thanks for putting that uh, on my plate. <laughs> and I just want to point out, it's been great that Alanic employed these taxonomies for us to use because Library of Congress, where who I'm supposed to be following, 
they don't even have a term for philanthropy. That's not a subject heading. So in the catalog record for the Atlantic Philanthropies, it says charities, mm -hmm. and which is not quite, you know, so, but having these real vocabularies that people are gonna recognize, especially if they've been on the website, I think is a lot help, more helpful than going into Library of Congress and trying to find a square peg to find, put in a round hole. Oh. Yeah. And I would add that um, we're trying to implement more of the PCS system using the Flux tagging system that's in the Flux database, um, but also in the metadata fields that are in Preservica. Okay, thank you all. Uh, once more, let's thank our panelists. <laughs>